Let us dwell together in peace. And let us not be instruments of our own or of others' oppression. And now may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Well, <clears throat> that reading was a hot mess, wasn't it? That Second Peter business? Oh, my goodness. Reminding us about some nasty flood and about some weird fiery situation and wrath and ugh. Uh, was very tempted to just skip over it and not do it, but we committed. We're going to deal with Second Peter, and uh, you know, so you got to take you got to take the good with the bad, right? And maybe it's not as bad as it sounds anyway. Now, <clears throat> I always have to remind people we don't even know who wrote that. So first of all, don't get too worked up about some long dead stranger. We don't even know who it was. You know nothing about him. So his opinion. We can, you know, we don't have to accept at face value. So there's that. Second of all, that passage is apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic literature is resistance literature. So even though it's very tumultuous, the purpose of it is to hope for a better day. Things are terrible now, but the, the apocalyptic writer, and this is a genre that was only popular for about 200 years before Jesus to about 200 years after Jesus. So it's a limited time that this is a popular genre. Uh, but this genre of literature is to imagine cataclysm that destroys injustice and oppression, and then God comes in and cleans up the mess. That's, that's the hope, that all of, this, all of this brutality, all of this empire, all of this haves and have-nots, all, all this wrong and ugly, it, it's just going to be, it's, it's, it can't last. And once it just blows up or implodes or whatever, gets washed away with a flood or burned up in fire or taken away with a tornado, what, whatever, then God comes, is going to come and make it all right. So it's never to focus on the ugliness anyway. The ugliness is getting rid of other ugliness and then being replaced with goodness. That's the imagination. That, that's the point of it. And I think people missing the point is why it became uh, less popular over time. And, and so you don't see that uh, after about 200 very often. So the prophets, though, spoke this great day of the Lord. The prophets spoke of a great and terrible day of the Lord. And the prophets, they referred to cataclysmic events as signs of divine action. So a storm or an invasion might signal the great and terrible day of the Lord. If, if our armies lose in battle, or if there's a great tornado, or a great flood, or a great earthquake, that might be, that might be God's footsteps causing all this rumbling as God is coming to, to, to usher in this great and terrible day. And some thought that before such a great and terrible day, the prophet Elijah would return. So the prophet will return, and then great turmoil will follow the prophet's return. And we easily see how that myth later got transferred to Jesus, right? That's what we're seeing in Peter, in 2 Peter. Peter just sort of re reimagining the Elijah myth. The prophet's going to return, and as, after the return, then a lot of turmoil, and then following the turmoil, it's going to be a brighter day. It's going to be okay. Well, in the New Testament, now remember, this is all the imagination of a writer. This is, this is the way that, that we watch scary movies as catharsis. It's a way that we watch sad plays. It's a way that we watch soap operas or read novels, that we are seeking a catharsis. It's how we deal with reality is by imagining either things way better or way worse. If we imagine them way worse, then we're like, well, see, we don't have it so bad. If we imagine it way better, oh, well, maybe we can get to that. So the literature is meant to have a healing impact, not to scare us. In the New Testament, the day of the Lord started referring to Jesus' return. And so Paul and Mark acted as if such a day would happen in their lifetimes or very shortly thereafter. We read in Mark, some of you hearing my voice today will not die before this happens. And uh, they, everybody died. That, that, you know, it just never happened, Right. Uh, Paul said, it's better not to even marry. Don't even bother to start a family. You won't have time to raise them because the, this day of the Lord is just around the corner. Well, people could have had great, 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 great grandchildren, but he just got it wrong. So when Matthew writes, people are already saying, wait, wait, you said it was, they said it was going to be any minute, and it's been way more than a minute. And so Matthew says, you know what? Nobody knows. It's going to happen. 
And it's going to happen soonish, but don't try to guess the date because it, it'll just frustrate you. We don't really know the date. Even the angels don't. But then also at the end of Matthew, Matthew has Jesus say, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of that age, which is long behind us now. So Matthew is saying, we don't know when he's coming back. Also, he never left. Then Luke, I think Luke is smartest of all of them. Luke seems to believe that, the spirit, that Jesus' spiritual turn happened at Pentecost. And from that moment on, the church is the return of Christ. And so it's, it's up to us. So we got to get busy. That's my view, by the way. Well, writing 100 years after Jesus' death, and 70 years after Paul, and 60 years after Mark, and 45 years after Matthew, and maybe as much as a decade after Luke, the anonymous writer of 2 Peter is adding his own stink to the narrative. And it's been evolving for over a century already, and now he's adding his thoughts and imagination to it. And if you thought Matthew was tired, people were getting tired, like we've been waiting, waiting, waiting. Well, this is another 45 years down the road when the anonymous writer of St. Peter has, has to deal with it in his community. And so the writer comes up with a cosmic timeline. God's time is measured differently, the writer surmises. Yes, in the year 130, we've been waiting since the year 29 for Jesus to come back. And that's over a century already. But in God's time, that might be just 11 minutes. A day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. In God's time, on God's watch, in God's calendar. So really, the return is immediate. But the immediacy is based on a chronometer that isn't of this world. How very convenient and entirely unverifiable. Oh, he's coming, Matthew says, but we can't know when. Plus, he never really left anyway, so work that out somehow. And look, oh, he did come, and it's us, so why are we just sitting around? But here's Peter, here's this person claiming to write in the voice of Peter saying, oh, it's just been a minute on that end of things, where time is very different says me because I just made it up, but you should believe it. And the writer adds, and anyway, Jesus is giving you time to get your affairs in order. So not only is it not such a long wait, but the long wait is on purpose and for your benefit. It's not long, but if it's long, it's good that it's long. I'm pretty sure the writer of 2 Peter ran for public office. <laughs> but see, I disagree with the theological premise that an angry God, yes, we're angry at the injustice, we're angry at the oppression, we're angry at the cruelty, we're angry that the, that the world is heating up, is baking us, and we just continue contributing to the problem. We're angry that transgender people are being de dehumanized, law by law by law, state by state, country by country. We're angry at the injustice, we're angry at the selfishness, we're angry that Gen X when we were in our 20s, had 9% of the wealth of the country, and the millennials at the same age have 4%. Following the same rules, going to college, trying to get a job, do all the right things, and yet each generation does not better than the previous one, but worse. We're angry about that. We're, we're angry about the greed. We're angry about the adverse. We're angry about the warmongering. We're angry, and so we want God to be angry too. But I disagree that God's anger, that, that God shares our anger. God shares our pain. God wants it healed, but what God does for us, God does through us. So I don't think God's sending flood or fire or any kind of pain. I think God is sending tears to help wash away the pain. And if, we, and if things are going to get better, the people who broke it are going to have to get to fixing it. And God is the power and the will and the hope within us that motivates us to do that. Church councils and hierarchies would have us believe that Christianity is a seamless story, reading back to the beginning. But the truth is, there was never just one Christianity. 
There's always been a plethora of Christianities. There is Christianity that sees Christ as a cosmic figure to be venerated. There is Christianity that sees Jesus as a prophet whose example is to be followed. There is Christianity that sees Jesus as a healer and Christians as trying to heal in his name. There is Christianity that sees Jesus as a radical social justice activist in whose name Christians are meant to work for justice. There is Christianity that sees Jesus as the suffering servant that stands in solidarity with the suffering and despised and forgotten people of the world. And like him, we are to stand with the marginalized. There is Christianity that sees Jesus as a lover of all, especially the otherwise unloved, and who calls his friends and followers to be the love of God in action. There is prudish Christianity. Oh, that's my least favorite kind. And there is joyous, fun, grace-filled Christianity. There is Christianity that evolved into the sort of religious dogma that Jesus opposed. And there is Christianity that threatens religiosity by offering an authentic spirituality that cannot be codified into narrow creeds or limited understandings of ancient scriptures. There are and always have been many Christianities. Since the very first Christians, there has always been many Christianities. And some of us fall into more than one of those Christian camps. I have practiced each of those Christianities in my 39 years. And and have practiced them two or three at a time, even still. Some of us fall into several of those camps. And of course, the first followers of Jesus were called just the followers of the way. They were Jewish and later included Gentile pagans who did not share Jewish traditions and worldviews. And the less Jewish the movement became, the less human Jesus became. And by the mid-second century, about the time 2 Peter pops up, Gentile Christians are basically a Christ cult, worshiping a God-man, much like the deities of Egypt, Greece, and Rome. That does not, however, that is not a criticism, that does not delegitimize those for whom Jesus became a God figure. But it does remind us that there are other and even older ways of seeing Jesus that are also faithful and life-giving. I am culturally and professionally Christian, but that designation doesn't mean much to me. Rather than the title Christian, I want my spirituality by any name to look something like Jesus's. I don't care much about the religion that evolved about Jesus. I'm much more interested in tapping into the spirituality practiced by Jesus. Christians sometimes frighten me. But Jesus never scares me. And I won't be scared by people who use his name in scary ways. I just dismiss them as as, as not offering anything that I'm interested in. No, Jesus gives me hope and courage and a desire to bring healing and justice to the world. I am a huge critic of the religion about Jesus, but I will spend the rest of my life trying to embrace the spirituality that Jesus lived so fully. Lived so fully that people wouldn't accept that he even died or certainly didn't stay dead. A spirituality that is so full, it helps you live so fully into your humanity that you express divinity. That's what I want, the Jesus kind of spirituality, which for him was Jewish. But again, I'm not interested in the names. I'm interested in the experience. The Christ cult's waiting for a Hercules or Apollo type figure to return and make everything better for those on the winning team is a development that would be news to Jesus. Guess who still hasn't shown up for dinner? It's been 2,000 years. And the writer of 2 Peter was complaining when people were complaining after it had been only 100 years. The scoffers. Well, guess what? I'm a graduate of Scoffer Theological Seminary. And if it hasn't happened in 2,000 years, it may or may not happen in the next 2,000. But I'm not, I don't care. It's time to do something. It is time to save the world or get off the pot. If we, we can't wait for Jesus. 
Guess what is still needed? The work that Jesus did, whether he shows up in person or not. And if we are the church, he shouldn't have to show up. We we shouldn't even need him to show up. Guess who's going to do it? Guess who didn't show up for dinner? Jesus. Guess what needs to be done? The work Jesus did. And guess who's going to do it? If it's going to be done, at least done now, it's going to be done by us. The sheep need to be fed now. The oppressed need to be liberated now. The hurting need to be comforted now. The broken need to have their vision of wholeness now. The, it is immoral to wait when we can offer those Christic blessings here and now. If we are following the way of Jesus, it should be as if he is with us right now every step of the way. I'm not waiting on Jesus, and there is no reason why he should have to wait on us to do what he did. And what did Jesus do? As he told the disciples of John the baptizer, tell John, the spiritually blind are beginning to see. Those crippled with fear are starting to move forward. Those who thought themselves untouchable are starting to feel worthy of love. And those who haven't heard good news are starting to be encouraged. And the poor are beginning to believe they deserve better. With or without Jesus' physical presence, Jesus' followers should still be doing that messianic work. We can be the healing presence of Christ in the world today, if we so choose. And this is the good news. Amen. Amen.